my background, um, I do work in food policy in Charlotte. One of my passions is childhood nutrition. I have four daughters, ages five, nine-year-old twins, and a 12-year-old. And um, I grew up on my grandparents' farm in central Florida. I spent a lot of my childhood there. Even though I still was a really unhealthy and picky eater, um, I had exposure to where food came from. They had cows, and they grew corn, and they grew strawberries, and all the things that you can grow in central Florida, which is not necessarily a wide variety of things. But um, we had chickens. and. Um, as I became a parent, I got into food and started living a healthier lifestyle and realized that I wanted my children to have those same exposures that I had as a child, but I live in the city. And it wasn't feasible for me to live out in the country, and so my husband and I decided that we were just gonna do what we could and build an urban farm. And we now have 17 chickens. We have tilapia in an aquaponics um, tank. <laughs> Um, that's always kind of a, it's in our basement right now, trying not to flood it three times now. Um, so it's, you know, I feel like sometimes we're, we're not quite dealing with what the farmers are dealing with, but sometimes it feels like that. Um, and, you know, we grow food anywhere that we can find a patch of sun, and we have a great community garden in our neighborhood. And so we saw that our children were getting that exposure to that, and what we really wanted to do, what I wanted to do, what I was passionate about, was what about all these kids who don't get that exposure, who don't, you know, they, they live in low-income neighborhoods where maybe they're not even allowed to go outside because it's so dangerous. And so growing food doesn't even seem like a possibility to them. And I got involved with the gardens at my children's school. I'm really fortunate they're in a, in a great public Montessori that has 30-plus gardens in the school. Every classroom has two gardens outside of it, and then we have gardens all over. So we grow food. We were already doing tastings in the classrooms. Um, and some of you probably know that one of, the, one of the things in North Carolina, you cannot bring food into the cafeteria that is grown anywhere. All food has to go through the school districts and all the regulations and all of that. So. Um, what I realized the impact I could have was if I could get involved with school gardens and farm to school programs on a citywide level, then I could help make sure that these kids could get exposed to vegetables and to growing food and understanding that you know, chicken breasts are not grown in the ground, as Joel Salatin likes to always talk about, people thinking happens, and that food doesn't just come from Walmart. And um, we've seen some really amazing, exciting changes um, with children and also their education development. I mean, it's, it's just, it's so unbelievable to see a child go and plant a garden, to watch it grow, to nurture it, and then to harvest it and taste it. And that is how you get children to eat vegetables. And um, so that is what I presented at, at the Ancestral Health Symposium. I did a poster of basically just the program that we're creating in Charlotte. And you guys are so lucky here in Asheville because you have Growing Minds and ASAP, and they have been doing this forever, and they're unbelievable. And I really look at them as mentors, and um, I, I do a lot of things that they do because there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. So I'm, I'm jealous of you guys. Um, so that's, that's the bulk of the work that I do. Um, I don't wear my paleo hat a whole lot when I go into that work because I just really can't. I'm dealing with politics and red tape and all I'm trying to do is I'm not trying to change the school lunches. I'm not trying to right now get food into the cafeterias. I will eventually. I'm just trying to expose children and families to a different way of thinking about how food is grown and where food comes from and just get that knowledge to connect us to what my father had with his family growing up on a farm and what so many people had 50, 60 years ago and we've just completely lost it in this current generation that we're in. Um, so that's a little bit about what I do now, how I got into paleo. I, um, like I said, when I had my children, I started wanting to learn more about healthy eating. I was a radio DJ from the time I was 17 until just about four years ago, and I was living off of caffeine and junk food and cigarettes, and that was my life until I had a baby. And um, when I first got pregnant, um, I was still like, going, it's just like so embarrassing to say this, but I was like, instead of having caffeinated Coke, I just went and got decaffeinated Coke, you know? Like I thought, oh, I'll just cut the caffeine out. <laughs> you know, so like luckily my child is really healthy and doesn't have two heads or anything. She's very normal. Um, she does have vision issues and she does have dental issues, but you know, hey. Um, so 
I switched to a midwife. I wanted a home birth, and I switched to this midwife at like 27 weeks pregnant, and she was like, we have got to clean your diet up. Like, you're a disaster. This is not going to work. You cannot, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to work with you. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'll do whatever. Just tell me what to do. So she was my first introduction, and that was 13 years ago, into making some lifestyle changes. So for me, this has been about a 13-year journey to, to get where I am right now. And what I found is that I was incredibly passionate about food and health. Once I learned about it, I just didn't know anything. And um, I'm a voice actor as well. And a few years ago, I started wanting to really kind of move away from radio and voiceover. It just didn't fill me. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I knew that I wanted to help people. And I just couldn't make my mind up. And at the time, I'd gone through some pretty serious stuff. I'd had a miscarriage that nearly ended my life. So I'd had this really huge life-changing experience, getting this second chance and realizing that I needed to be healthier. Um, I had a hormone imbalance, which is actually what caused the miscarriage. And so I had some serious health issues going on. I was anemic for a year after that. And I was dancing. I'm a ballet dancer. And I was about to do a recital. And I had this baby weight that I couldn't get rid of. And I had this girlfriend who was doing this grain-free diet. And I was like, that's crazy. I'm not giving up corn chips. And we kept talking about it. And she like lost all this weight right away. And she felt great. And she's telling Rob Wolf this and Sarah Fergoso that. And I'm like, what? This is crazy. So you know, we talked about it. We talked about it a few times. And I was like, I'm not getting in a leotard on that stage until I lose this baby weight. So like, you know, for me, I had, I had some, some reasons, some motivation to do it. So I did. I, I went home and I told my husband, we're cleaning the cabin. So let me back up and say, I have the kind of husband who I'll go, we're going vegan. Okay. You know, we're going to Mars. Okay. So I'm really fortunate in that way, but he's my second husband and I'll tell you about my first in a little while. Um, different story. So I went home and said, we're cleaning out the cabinets. We're going, we're going grain free. We're dropping all this stuff out. Okay, okay. So we did it. And unlike the times when we had gone vegan or vegetarian, done these other crazy, you know, kind of extreme diets, we actually felt really amazing. Like we kind of had the carb flu the first day. I remember laying on the couch, just like having fantasies about eating the corn chips <laughs> and like thinking about just sugar and like it just. It was just, pl it was playing out in like these ways that I hadn't even thought, food I hadn't thought about in years. It was like, you know, unreal. And so once we started feeling better and then I lost the weight that I wanted to lose and all of a sudden like I went in to get my physical done and I wasn't anemic anymore and I'd been anemic my whole life. And so my iron was like off the charts from what it had ever been. And I just thought, well, this is crazy. Like, is this all from this diet? Um, and I still had the hormone imbalance, and that was an issue. But thankfully, Rob Wolf has this really great podcast. And if you have health problems and you write into him, sometimes he'll actually talk about you on his podcast, and he'll help you solve your problems. And he did that for me. And I was able to deal with my estrogen dominance. And I actually have a testimonial on Rob's page, and it's on mine as well, on my blog, about you know healing those issues. And so what I really found is that Paleo changed my life in so many ways, and um, what it really did was give me an outlet for mental clarity that I had never had before, dealing with childhood trauma and years of therapy and all these things that I just couldn't break through. Going to this level of eating this way really opened my body and my mind up to possibility and change and letting go of things. And that's really the message that I'm going to talk about tonight is what happened with my family. Um, so before we were ever paleo, about six months before we started doing that, one of my daughters, who was about six at the time, had asthma for four years straight. So for four years, she coughed nonstop. And it all started about the time that my ex-husband and I split up. And I had, at the time, two two-year-olds and a five-year-old. And it was incredibly stressful. And um, my daughter started coughing. And we didn't know what it was for a long time. And finally, she was diagnosed with asthma. And we were doing breathing treatments and the inhaler and the, you know, the nebulizer and the everything that we could possibly do. And I was trying every natural treatment that I knew to do. And she just wasn't getting better. And so we went to a naturopathic doctor, and he did some sensitivity testing, and it showed up that she had issues with gluten and rice and oats and dairy. Paleo, right? Um, and so we took her off all of those things, and her asthma disappeared overnight. 
In fact, she hasn't coughed since, and that was three years ago. Um, and we saw this just amazing improvement with her, and so we said, let's look at her twin who has sensory processing disorder, and let's see if going at least gluten-free could have some of the same impact on her. And this is, you know, long before we've heard of anything paleo. And so we did the same thing. We went to the psychologist, and we went to the naturopath, and we did all these doctors, and we talked about going gluten-free, and so we pulled her off gluten, and we saw changes. We saw a child who had tantrumed and cried, you know, cried nonstop since she was born, tantrumed, beat her sisters up, all of a sudden be a child that could connect with you and could understand you, could understand multi-steps now instead of the single step way that we would have to describe things to her, could just talk to her sisters in this way instead of beating them up. That was beautiful. It would bring tears to my eyes because I saw this child break free out of the fight and the pain that she'd had her entire life. And so then my older daughter was having digestive issues, and I thought, well, let's try to get her to go gluten-free, and let's deal with some of these stomach issues and these hives and all these different things she has going on. So we did the same thing. But let me back up. So I'm sharing custody at this point. Three older daughters with my ex-husband and his wife, and then I have a daughter who's my youngest with my husband now. And I was not in a very great relationship with my ex-husband and his wife. So this was all a challenge. We would have to go through doctors and the naturopaths and psychologists to be able to get him on board to say, you know, these children really need to have this diet or have some sensitivity testing or, or whatnot. And so um, we're seeing all these great benefits and all they could see was this is really a pain and we don't want to buy gluten-free food and we don't want to do this. And so for a year I tried and at times they would agree and get on board. And so about a year ago we had made an agreement and the children were supposed to be gluten-free at their house and you know they were eating a paleo diet at my house. So it was a good mix. We had things set up at school. They would take their own community snack. They took their lunches every day. So they were never being exposed. Um, we would take gluten-free cupcakes or a paleo treat or whatever to a birthday party. They never felt left out. They all actually felt incredibly empowered by the way that, you know, they were living. They would explain to their friends that they felt better, that, you know, they were, they, they weren't sick anymore or they could behave or, you know, they didn't have stomach aches anymore. There were all these different reasons that they felt really good about it. So last October, I got a phone call from my ex-husband, and he said, I can't do this anymore. It's causing too many problems at my house. And I fought, and I said, what could we do? We'd already gone to our doctor, and our doctor had already said, yeah, this is better for the kids. They need to be doing this. And our psychologist was saying, for the daughter with the sensory processing disorder, yes, this is good for her. She's doing well. And he just couldn't hear it anymore. And it, it, it was too much. And so I hung up the phone, and I sat in my kitchen on the floor, and I just sobbed. And at that moment, I began to lose control over my children and the way that they were eating and their health. And that's all I could see. And so I went on the warpath. I became Mama Bear. And all I could think about was, you're hurting my children. How can you not see what this is doing to them, that they're so healthy? Unfortunately, it was very immediate that they put the gluten back in the girls' lives. It was overnight. In fact, the day that it happened, they were actually with their dad, and we were on a schedule where they were there Wednesday night through Monday morning, and then would come back to me for about a week and a half and go back. So I'd have them nine nights, he'd have them five. And they told, they didn't really explain to the girls, they just said, hey, guess what, you're going back on gluten, you can have it now, and when you go to school, you can have community snack, you can have whatever you want anytime. And it was an incredibly confusing time for my children, for me, I'm sure for, for my ex-husband and his wife as well. And um, I was getting phone calls and emails from teachers at school saying that the girls were coming in saying, oh yeah, guess what, we can have gluten. And I had such great relationships with these teachers and administration, they were like, we're not doing anything until we hear from Kendall because we know that this is, you know, this is not something that she's okay with. And so I just... I had to say, yeah, I mean, that I can't, I can't fight this anymore, that this is the option. And so um, I still tried to hold on to some control. We sat at home, you know, we're still going to eat the way that we eat at home, and you're going to eat the way that you eat where you're at your dad's, and I still had a lot of anger. We didn't, we've been really great. We've never been, um, 
the divorced couple who talks about these things in front of our children. And we don't, we do our very, very best to not put them in the middle, but children are amazingly spiritual beings and they know everything and they sense when things are not good and, and they can tell. And so my children definitely went through some emotional struggles and now they're being introduced to food that made them sick. And so um, our psychologist saw an immediate decline in my daughter with the SPD. It happened pretty quickly. She went from being the kid who could function to the kid who couldn't function. And um, all my girls got sick after not having been sick in a couple of years. And so we just sort of dealt with one thing after another. And I continued to be on the warpath. And I kept trying to find every option that I could to figure out how can I convince these people that my children need to be gluten free and they need to eat this way. We ended up in mediation in February. And it was basically two hours of them saying, we're not going to do this. And I came in with letters from doctors, and I came in with letters from psychologists, and I came in with letters from naturopaths, and I did everything that I could do. And I walked out of there, and again, I got in the car, and I just sobbed. And that was the very beginning of me giving up control and letting go. And I was a wreck for days. In fact, I had a business trip to Denver the very next day, and it was just such a challenge. I remember those times that I felt like I had lost my children. I felt like because I couldn't control what my children were eating, and I couldn't control what was going to happen to their health, that it was so all or nothing for me. It was so black and white, and I could see nothing beyond that, that this is just it. This is the end. And so some time went by, and I started really just having some perspective and looking deep inside to see what was going on with me. Why did I need so much control? Why was it so important for me to control what was going on at this other house? Were my children really going to suffer forever if they're exposed to food that I think is not good for them? You know, they have two great houses over their head. They have two really loving families. Sure, they're eating some stuff that, you know, like doesn't make me feel super great, but they're also eating pretty healthy food at their dad's house. They're not going absolutely against, you know, they have vegetables and meat and things that I think are really good for them. And so I began this search of how could I have some peace with this? Because I knew that my anger and my hostility towards their other parents and my need for control was just going to hurt my children in the long run. It wasn't going to hurt their other parents. They didn't care. They had already made it clear, we're doing what we want to do, and you have no control or say over it. And I knew it was going to hurt me. I knew that I was sick inside because I had all this anger and hostility and judgment and fear, really, was what it came down to. And so what I realized was, you know, studying nutritional therapy and doing this kind of work that I do, my children have an amazing foundation. I am giving them so many gifts that they're going to carry throughout their life. And as soon as they're old enough, you know, they're going to know, oh, I, this is how I can eat and I can feel good. And if I want to not feel good, then I can go eat this. And they have the skills. They live in a house where they go outside and they pick eggs out of the coop every day and bring them in and they make their own eggs for breakfast and they grow food and you know I found some balance for the first time probably in my life I found some gray that I could let go that I didn't have to be in control and it changed my whole life my entire life changed in that moment and that's really what I've been talking to people about ever since because not everybody's in a situation where they're sharing children with an ex-spouse or, you know, or they even have children. I mean, there's so many different ways that this looks as in maybe you have a spouse who you're living with who isn't on board or maybe you have grandparents who aren't on board and you, they keep your children often. Maybe you're single and you just have a partner who isn't on board and you're trying to do this and, you know, have the willpower to eat this way and then somebody's shoving pizza in their mouth in front of you or Oreos, you know, whatever it is. Um, it's, I'm sorry, there's like a, is that a deer or a dog? Um, it, sorry, I'm, I'm like, I love the mountains. This is beautiful. I'm like, wow. is it a goat? I'm like, I can't even see that far away. That's so exciting. Sorry. I love it here, you guys. Um, there's a goat across the street. It's fantastic. So anyway, so what my message really is about is it's about finding balance. 
and it's about figuring out what you can do and what you have control over, which is essentially yourself. And that's all you can control. And if you have children, then you know what's possible. If they're living with you and you have a spouse who's supportive, fantastic. I mean, that's the best that can happen, right? When everybody's on board and you get to do things the way that you want to do in your house. But is that the typical situation? No, not from what I'm hearing and not from the people that I talk to who say, you know, I have a husband who just won't get on board and, you know, I go away, I, I fix the meals and then I go away and they're like feeding my child, you know, cereal or whatever it may be. And so feeling like it's not the end of the world is probably the most important aspect to coming to terms with how you can have peace in these situations. Um, some of the things that I think are, are really helpful in if you're, you know, if you are living with somebody, because these situations are different, if you are living with a spouse, you know, if you're not doing the cooking and you want to eat this way and you're not doing the shopping, well, what do you expect? You know, you have to share the responsibility or you have to take over the responsibility. So, you know, in my house, I have a partner who's on board, but we have children who, you know, would rather not eat that way. But, you know, we are the ones who are cooking the meals and we're doing the shopping, so that's how it's going to go. And so if you're in a situation where you're living with somebody and they don't want to eat this way, then, well, I'm going to go buy this food and this is what's going to be in the house. I'm going to clean the pantry out and I'm going to cook this food and, you know, set clear boundaries or sit down and be understanding. I think this actually works for when you're dealing with grandparents who don't understand hearing what their concerns are. Well, why wouldn't they be supportive of your children eating this or you eating this or, you know, what are, I think being sympathetic to people's needs is really important because I think sometimes we tend to proselytize a little bit in this community. I'm not going to name names. Um, early on, you know, I think we find this way of life and we feel so great and our health issues, you know, get better and we lose weight and we have all this vibrancy and we're so excited and we want everybody to know like how fantastic this great caveman diet is, right? People are really turned off by that. Not always. Sometimes there's people like, that's really great, but there's a lot of people who maybe are more middle of the road and they just think it's very extreme or, you know, but we've heard for years that, you know, low fat, high carb, it's good, right? And so people are in their own mindset and we need to be understanding of that. So anybody who's around us, even if you're just talking about friends coming over for dinner, you know, whoever it is in your life who is questioning why you're doing this or it's affecting your life because of children or how you live and how you want to eat, it's really important to stop and not be right. You know, it's really, really important. One of the things that I always remember is, do you want to be right or do you want to have a relationship? And so I think that's important to think like, how can I find some middle ground with people and still do what's important to me and still have integrity about what I believe and what's, you know, going to be great for my health and for myself and my well-being, but knowing that you can find some balance. It's always important to get out of the black and white and the pendulum swinging when you're, when you're dealing with other people and these things and to just try to find that gray area. And I think that the paleo community in general is finding that. You know, I'm thinking of the conversations that were happening at the Ancestral Health Symposium two years ago at the first one in Los Angeles. And it was, it was sounding very dogmatic back then and there were there were great concerns about that and really from just coming back from Atlanta and hearing how people were so much more flexible about things. I mean there were white potatoes served at lunch at the Ancestral Health Symposium. Two years ago we were having a fight about white potatoes, right? So it's always about being willing to evolve and we're seeing it on a community basis nationally, internationally and we need to be doing it in our own lives too. Being willing to be wrong, to evolve, to grow, to learn, to experience. So I think that that's really important when you're talking to other people, just being open-minded and hearing their concerns, letting them really know you're not judging them. I'm not judging you because you like to eat donuts. You know, that's not what it's about at all. Like just, you know, yes. Another thing is finding healthier replacements. I really, there's this big thing about paleo treats and that that is a beautiful little fight online between bloggers and I feel like you do what you have to do. When I first got into paleo, I was staying up till 11 o'clock making apple cinnamon almond flour muffins for my children so I could make sure there was food going in their bodies and that was how we did it. 
There's no judgment there. If you can switch from eating somewhat of a standard American diet and take your kids off cereal and then get them to eat eggs and bacon and sauerkraut every morning, hallelujah to you. I am going to bow down to you because that's awesome. <laughs> like, that is so beautiful. That did not happen in my house. My kids are like, are you kidding me? Please go buy us the puffins from Trader Joe's. Like, this is not fun. We're not doing this, right? But now, these years later, they're making their own eggs. And they're like, why isn't the bacon ready yet? You guys know it's International Bacon Day, right? Yeah. Do you know that? <laughs> International Bacon Day. I probably started and said, I'm very excited. I've been talking about it all day. So, and I put bacon in my Brussels sprout slaw back there. So just a little gift to you guys. Um, Again, like if you have kids who are going to birthday parties, we've, we've always done, you know, a gluten-free cupcake occasionally. It's a lot of sugar, but, um, or, you know, make an almond flour treat. There's a bazillion paleo dessert cookbooks and recipes online. You can find something. I'm a believer that, you know, we want to make sure kids don't feel like the weirdos. So I was the kid who was allergic to dairy and corn and dogs and grass and every other weird thing when I was a kid. So... I um, would pour apple juice in my cereal in the morning. I don't know how, I was allergic to corn, I don't know why I was eating cereal. None of this makes sense. My parents didn't really have it all together back then. I don't know, they're great now. But, um, and then I would go to a birthday party and everybody would be like eating like, you know, all the stuff like cereal or whatever with milk and I would just be such an outcast. So I have this experience of being the kid who ate the weird stuff. My dad would like buy this really weird fake milk stuff like back then. I mean, now we have a hundred different options, but this stuff was weird and gross. And, you know, I was that kid that had to like do that stuff. And I'm very um, understanding of my children in that situation and knowing that they go to school and they're not having the community snack that everybody else is having. They're going to their own little thing or they're going to a birthday party and they bring their own thing. So really empowering them to be excited about that is helpful. But I also want to make sure they have a good time. And you know, and they're not feeling weird about not having what everybody else is having. So I don't have a problem with finding some kind of treat because that's what it is. It's a treat. It's not a snack. It's a treat. And it's a special occasion thing. And we want to make special occasions fun, right? So I think that finding a healthier replacement, um, you know, like there's fake paleo pizzas, right? Cauliflower crust. There's bacon crust, right? Has anybody seen that? Um, that's awesome. Yeah. Like there's, well, I mean, of course, we all want replacements. Why would we have 20 cookbooks out here that have like meal, you know, things that we could replace that we love when we ate the standard American diet and now we can have in this like healthier way. I mean, food is about community and there's, there's some things about food that make us feel really good. And so I think that that's okay. I think that there's, there's, no, there's no worries about doing that. If it doesn't feel good to you, then don't do it. But I think if you have children involved and you want to figure out ways to make things smoother transition for them, great way to do it. Um, make sure they have healthy snack options. Kids like are growing and they're hungry and they need a lot of fat too. So one of the things that I do at home is I keep a... Um, cupcake tin and I just fill it up with like things you know so I don't feel like they're just like mom I'm hungry mom I'm hungry. my kids are older now and they're they're much you know more capable of getting their own snacks but when they were younger and toddlers who loved to graze and you know it would just be so great to just throw some fruit and some nuts and some jerky and whatever else coconut chips just throw them in a in there so I think that's a great option for um, young children because we need to keep kids you know fed and of course not too long before meals because then they won't eat their food so you know that's another thing is like making sure that when it comes to meal time and you want to try something new you want to make sure your kids are hungry because that's probably one of the best ways to get them to be able to eat um, again like just dropping the control over it just having a mentality of letting things be and not feeling like you have to be in control when you're dealing with other people and understanding their concerns just acceptance. You know, one of the things that I, I talk about a lot on my blog is radical acceptance. And you can accept that people are where they are or they are who they are without having judgment. And people don't believe that. They don't understand that acceptance is separate from saying, oh, that's good or bad. Acceptance is just seeing what is. So if you're in a situation with somebody who is not supportive of your choices and your lifestyle, you can just accept that they are they are what they are. It's going to give you peace inside to be able to go forward and make the decisions that you need to make. Certainly did for me. Um, 
Packing lunches for kids, that's hard. I pack four every, well, I don't pack, I make them pack them now. <laughs> I did pack four every day, and now they're old enough to pack their own. Even my five-year-old is packing her own lunch. That's part of it, getting your kids involved. That's the most important thing that you can do when you are cooking with children, you want them to try new foods, you need to have them preparing food. Even two-year-olds can be in the kitchen doing stuff. You know, they can have a little uh, child plastic knife, cut mushrooms, cut things up, um, washing. Kids love salad spinners. Just throw everything in a salad spinner, put water in, empty it out, and just let them just spin all. It's like a top, you know? And so the toddlers will do that all day long. Um, and then, I mean, my kids were at the stove cooking by seven or eight, probably eight, and now they're, my middle children are nine, and they're cooking every day. So it's really important to have your children involved in that. And I think that that's, again, one of these lessons that we're looking at, saying it's not this all or nothing thing. If they don't eat paleo or they're not gluten-free, they're not going to die. You know, they're not, their life's not going to be horrible. They're not going to have a probation officer. Like, it's, what it really means is, all right, let's figure out what all these other things that we can do and give them that foundation of when it comes time for them to be grown-ups and make these decisions, then they can make them. You know, then they know, oh, I remember doing this with my mom or my dad and I remember doing this or I've been cooking for years and so it's not about us like spoon feeding everything to them, it's about letting them figure it out themselves. Um, and again, this is probably like my biggest message is don't proselytize, lead by example. The best thing that you can do and when you're dealing with people who are not interested in this way of eating or this lifestyle is to just be an example and to let them see that you glow because you're healthy and you're eating well and you're sleeping and you're working on your stress management and you're working out and you're doing all these things that this lifestyle you know talks about doing and people will come to you it happens to me all the time. People saw the changes that I made over the last few years and they wanted to know, what did you do? I can't tell you, even before I was doing nutrition, how many people went to this lifestyle because they just saw me. Not because I ever, in fact, I never talk about it. I really feel uncomfortable bringing it up to people unless they come to me first. And I think that that's so important.